Hello, I'm Logan Phillips and welcome to my vlog, or as we like to call it, the Vlogan. This is a vlog dedicated to people with special needs and those who love them. Good morning or good afternoon or evening whenever you're listening to this vlog. I am so lucky to have with me Jennifer Smith. I can't say where she's exactly from because when you hear her biography, she does so much. Jennifer Smith is a clinical psychologist and board certified behavior analyst. She specializes in treating children and adolescents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. She is the program director at the LEND program through the uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And she's a uh, professor at the University of Cincinnati. And she is the director of a, of a program called Starting Our Adventure Right. And she's going to talk about all of those things today. Uh, and we're lucky to have her. So Jennifer, thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Logan. It's really great to be here with you. Yeah, I'm excited to, to, to have the listeners and viewers learn about um, all that is down in Cincinnati. I'm in Columbus um, and all that's down in Cincinnati. And I, I'm guessing that after today, you're going to have some people um, traveling from Columbus down to Cincinnati to take advantage of all the things that you've put in place. We would love that. So, um, so let's start with uh, the LEND program. Could you tell the folks about the LEND program and what your work there is and what people do with LEND? Sure, I'll start with uh, describing what LEND stands for. So LEND stands for Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. And it is a training program for graduate students who are going to be the next leaders within the field of developmental disabilities. So it's an interdisciplinary training program where we get folks from a lot of different fields coming in, but they all have the common interest of working with developmental disabilities. Uh, and then the other kind of cool thing about that program is in addition to graduate students, we have family members of kids with developmental disabilities. Uh, so oftentimes we have moms. Um, and then also siblings of people with disabilities and then uh, also self-advocates. So people who have lived experience. So people who have a diagnosis of a developmental disability, they all come together. They're together for a whole year of training, really focused on leadership and their own leadership journeys. And then also that commitment to being the next generation of leaders in the field of developmental disabilities. So we have trainees that are spread throughout the country. Um, this is my ninth year of being the LEND director, uh, and we have trainees in 24 states uh, across the country, um, as well as a few international. So um, wow. really a big web of trainees that we have uh, had the opportunity to be a part of their journey. Wow. Do folks uh, end with like a certification from the LEND? Yeah, program? we have a certification that is provided um, that, you know, explains how they went through the entire program. And it's really great, too, because it's a national network. Um, so we're one of 52 LEND programs across the country. And if you want to work in developmental disabilities, it really sets you apart. And um, I can say that from personal experience, I was a LEND trainee two times uh, while I was in graduate school, um, both here at Cincinnati and then in Omaha, Nebraska. And I think it really set me apart um, that I had this extra training and this extra expertise. And that's what we hear from trainees all the time, you know, when they go to interviews and they talk about their LEND experience that re that really gives them um, an edge on a lot of the folks that are out, you know, applying for these same jobs. And is it a competitive program? Do people need to apply to get into the LEND program? Yeah, people do apply. So a lot of the trainees that we have who are graduate students, they will apply as a part of their, uh, we call it practicum experience. So doing their practical work out in the field. Um, and so we have trainees that are a part of these graduate programs from University of Cincinnati, Xavier, Wright State, Northern Kentucky, Dayton, um, and we have also those family members and self-advocates, and we're looking for a little bit different, you know, uh, skills and expertise in, in those. So graduate students are the folks 
experts that are going to be out clinically working in the field, serving our population. And then for family members, we really want them to be advocates and really see it bigger than just their own child, but really being an advocate for the field of disability. And same thing for our um, adults with disabilities, our self-advocates. We want them to really be a part of systems change and not just participating, um, you know, for themselves, but for kind of the bigger picture. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So that's through Children's Hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And then you you also work at UC. What do you do at UC and who do you who do you teach or who do you Yeah, so them? our faculty appointment uh, through Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we have a faculty appointment with the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Um, so I am an associate professor within that College of Medicine um, as a result of all of the training that I do with these graduate students that are in the LEN program. Got it. Um, so we have uh, folks that are getting their master's degrees, folks that are doing their doctoral programs, uh, doing residencies, doing postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, and so my training uh, or my um, education and teaching is for those graduate students. Got it. Great. Um, so now I'd love to talk a little bit about boots on the ground, uh, sort of rubber meets the road programs that you Absolutely. are that you have done, and um, that that work is through the being the director of the Starting Our Adventure Right. Um, I, I I would love to start if we could about talking about the zoo, and mm -hmm. then maybe some of the other partners, and then how the program uh, got started. But I'd love to talk about the zoo if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So the zoo had reached out to us a couple of years ago as the disability experts in Cincinnati, and they were really interested in helping everyone who came to the zoo have a better experience. And that included people with developmental disabilities, uh, such as autism, Down syndrome, spina bifida, cerebral palsy. Um, they really wanted everybody to come to the zoo and have an awesome experience and to feel welcomed and supported. Um, so we started working on a grant uh, that was funded through the Institutes of Museums and Library uh, library services. And we have had a three-year grant in place for the last couple of years that have uh, allowed us to provide training to all of the people that work at the zoo on how to understand developmental disabilities a little bit more, how to feel more comfortable and confident when um, having visitors that come in that might have um, you know, just unique needs and might need a little extra support. Uh, so we've trained all of those folks. And then we've also done a lot of really cool supports that are available on the Cincinnati Zoo's website um, as a result of our Access for All program is the name of our specific program that is designed towards uh, supporting our folks and a lot of great information on the Cincinnati Zoo website that families can go to ahead of their visit at the zoo and say, okay, here's a social narrative that tells me exactly, you know, what I can do to prepare my child when going to the zoo. Um, and a video narrative that has, you know, point of view, features that, you know, show the zoo on a video format so kids can kind of get familiar and say, oh, this looks familiar to me, like this is comfortable. Um, and then oh, also... Awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. And Thane Maynard, who is the, um, you know, head of the zoo in Cincinnati, he reads the, uh, the social narrative on the video. Um, so you get to hear his voice, which is really cool. Um, and that's been really neat, too, that we've had support from the top down, um, that the leadership at the Cincinnati Zoo has really embraced this work and really been a leader within our community um, of setting it up that this is something that is important for our community and that everybody needs to be included when they go out um, into these community spaces. That, that's um, great. There's actually a specific section on the zoo's website that talks about planning your visit and yeah. it, with unique needs and we can find those narratives very easily there. 
Yeah, absolutely. Wow. There's uh, the social narratives that are basically stories that prepare individuals for going to the zoo. Um, there's also schedules um, that help the families kind of plan their visits um, of helping with transitions kind of during their visit to the zoo. Uh, and then also a lot of really great information about how to plan a visit. So let's say your child, you know, your child is only going to be able to do like an hour, you know, or less at the zoo. And, you know, the zoo is a big place. And so we have designed an adventure planning guide that divides the zoo kind of into quadrants where the families can see, okay, these are all of the animals and all of the activities in this particular area. Um, they're in this quadrant. Let's focus on this today. And maybe the next time we come, we can focus on a different one. Um, so a lot of supports that are designed to help the families prepare. And then on the day of, when they go to the visit to the zoo, do, they can check out uh, what we refer to as sensory bags. And so um, the zoo can be a really overstimulating place. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, designed bags that the families can check out that have uh, noise canceling headphones and sunglasses and scratch and sniff stickers because the zoo can be smelly. Mm -hmm. um, they have a chewy tube that if the kids need to have like a little bit extra kind of oral uh -huh. stimulation if they get nervous. Um, and then we also have some kind of behavior kind of regulation kind of tools in there as well. Um, in addition to a sensory map where we know that, okay, we're not going to be able to control all of the stinky smells at the zoo, but we can at least let the families know that, okay, these are the areas that are really smelly at the zoo. These the are the house. areas. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that is on there. <laughs> um, and the flamingos. Yeah. So oh, wow. some yeah, some stinky areas in the zoo. So that way families can know, okay, if my child is really, really struggling with smells, then that might not be the best place to go. Or if we do, maybe we can use those scratch and sniff stickers that are in the bag. That is just, wow, how fabulous. Yeah, it's and, awesome. And then, did, did you tell me that there was actually construction as part of that grant, um, some calming rooms for folks? Yes. Um, so we were able to develop two calming rooms in collaboration uh, with the University of Cincinnati Occupational Therapy Department, um, actually a former student of mine. So I'm very proud of her. Um, so Valerie Miller was very instrumental in doing the calming rooms. Uh, she's an occupational therapist, and that is her area area of expertise is knowing how to help kids calm down when they get overwhelmed and overstimulated. And sometimes we know that the zoo can be very overstimulating and that families just, maybe they don't need to leave the zoo, they just need to go and take a break and they need to have a quiet calming space to be able to do that. Um, so we were able to design in collaboration with the zoo architect, um, two calming spaces, one that is at the entrance of the zoo at the welcome center. And then one is that at the other end of the park, um, kind of more kind of in the park. And so uh, two great spaces that families can check out for a half hour or more if they need it um, to just be able to say, okay, you know, I, our family needs to go take a break. We want to stay at the zoo, but we just need to go and kind of chill out for a while. And that's really two great spaces that families can go and use, um, you know, to hopefully extend their visit to the zoo. That's awesome. And yeah, so that's really cool. you're the, the starting our adventure, right? That's also helped some other places. And can you just mention those? And then let's talk about how it started at the at the airport. Yeah, so we have been really lucky um, that Cincinnati is a pretty close-knit, you know, community, and a lot of the folks that work at different cultural organizations kind of know each other and hear about all the cool stuff that's happening, and so um, as a result of this uh, program, Starting Our Adventure Right, we have been able to work with 16 different community partners here in Cincinnati um, to develop a like-minded network of organizations 
Um, so we are uh, calling the network the Greater Cincinnati Access and Inclusion Network. Um, and that includes the zoo, obviously, and then also, uh, and I'll talk about this in a second, with the airport, and then other cultural organizations within town. So a lot of the museums, um, the theaters, uh, ballet, um, we have also done work with the parks, as well as the Cincinnati Cyclones. Um, we've done a couple of sensory friendly hockey games with awesome. them. Um, and so that work started several years ago when CVG Airport contacted us and said, we really want to do better, you know, for families who have kids with autism, how can we start to have some training for our staff? Um, so we have trained a lot of the staff that work at the airport, including the folks that work at TSA security, because uh, that seems to be like a really big kind of trigger for our kids as they have a hard time getting through security, like a lot of us do. Yeah. Um, and then they wanted to have practice um, events for families. So we have been really lucky Lucky Delta has offered two times a year um, a flight or a, um, an aircraft for us to be able to use for these practice events where families can come and they go through all of the steps of air travel. Um, so they come in, they bring, you know, a little packed bag, you know, that they send, uh, you know, through luggage. And then they go through security and then they wait at the gate and then we board a plane um, that Delta has provided and then we're able to taxi around the airport, um, which is really cool because then wow. families can see how their kids do on an airplane and if it's something that they think that they're going to be able to do successfully with a little practice because that's what we know our kids just need a little you know practice a little preparation um, it's one of those programs I think could probably benefit everyone mm -hmm. um, this is just kind of designed towards people with developmental disabilities but um, we host two events a year unfortunately COVID has put kind of a wrench in that and we haven't done it over the last year but usually we do an event in the spring and an event in the fall where families can come and uh, see what it's like uh, without having to spend the money on a ticket for yeah. their child. So how would they find out when, when those are happening and sign up for it, the viewers and the listeners? How would they do that? So CVG has a particular spot on their website um, that announces these programs. Um, the uh, program at the airport has actually changed names. Um, it's called the LIFT program, L-I-F-T. Um, and there was, uh, unfortunately, another SOAR uh, program that was part of kind of aviation, kind of airline industry. Yes. <laughs> and so they had to kind of name it something different, but it's the LIFT program. Um, and families can go directly to the CBG website to be able to register. And then we at Cincinnati Children's um, in our Division of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, which is my home division, we have a Facebook page and we have um, a mailing list that we send out to families and schools and other um, kind of disability organizations throughout Cincinnati. The program at the, or all of the programs at the airport, is that ongoing? Is the, if, if, if a person is being trained at the TSA, they're, they're a new hire, are they getting this training ongoing as part of what they get when they get hired on and they onboard? That would be the ideal. Um, it is not set up that way for every organization. Um, some of the organizations that we have worked with have incorporated it into their uh, just employment kind of training, you know, when somebody starts at the organization. Um, what we hope is that, and this is something that COVID has kind of been a benefit for us, is that it has forced us to use technology a little bit more. Um, and I think that that's kind of like the next step is that we'll end up doing some video trainings 
that the organizations can use. That's what we have just transitioned to at the zoo. Um, I used to do live trainings, you know, for the employees and just from a sustainability standpoint, we have decided to do videos that way that the any of the employees that come in can watch them kind of on their own time um, and then use us as a resource for more specific questions and kind of scenarios that come up. Um, so we're hoping to kind of get that into everybody's, you know, kind of training. Uh, but it's um, one of those things that I think is just a matter of resources, I would yeah. say is kind of the biggest issue. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, this has just been absolutely wonderful. I, I, I mean, it's it's always great to talk about what people are doing in the disability community, but I, I love the programs where I know that the listeners and viewers are going to leave with something that they can actually do. And I yeah. mean, you are you seem to be at the forefront of just getting people access to the world outside of their homes and out, outside of their community. So, um, as a as a person in the community, thank you for all of your work. No, thank you. It's my pleasure. This really fulfills me and fuels my my heart and soul. So I you, love you this can work. Tell. I mean, you can tell by the way you talk about it and, uh, and, and just your passion for it. So um, this has been great. Thank you again, Jennifer. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Vlogan. Please like, share, and subscribe to the RRPG channel so you can stay up to date with some of the latest news in the disability community.